Welcome to Shovel Talk, a podcast for economic developers. From your friends at the Golden Shovel Agency. Hello, and welcome to our last episode of our inaugural season of Shovel Talk. Like we do every month, um, we're going to kick it off with asking Amanda where in the world she is. And I did hear something about a pretty cool excursion you had recently. Tell us a little bit about it. Yes. So um, during my time here in South Africa, um, you know, two months is quite a while. I, I was able to do a lot of stuff. But one really cool thing I did over the weekend was actually visit another country that exists inside of South Africa. So it's one of three enclaves in the world. So it's the country of Lesotho. And it's famous for so many things, but um, a couple really cool things about it. For one, it has the highest lowest point in the world. So that's a little confusing, but basically if you compare its lowest point, the country's lowest point to the lowest point of all the other countries in the world, it's the highest. So it basically exists in the sky. The entire country exists in the sky, um, in the mountains. Really, really neat. The entire country exists a thousand meters above sea level. So it's really, really cool to visit. We actually drove down one of the most dangerous roads in the world as well called Sani Pass. It's on a lot of those top 10 most dangerous uh, roads in the world articles. And then we also visited a waterfall that is the world's longest abseil. So it's, it's the longest um, face of a waterfall that you can actually rappel down. And that's in the Guinness world book of records. So got to see a lot of cool things over the weekend. The country actually just has one road through it, one paved road. The, uh, the people of the country, they're called Basutu and they are really big on uh, keeping their culture alive, uh, you know, their past, um, their history alive. And so a lot of the people are still doing things like farming with oxen, pulling the, the tools. They're still carrying things by cart and donkey, you know, very, very few uh, cars in the country, quite a bit of, of moving around by horse and, and donkey. So it was really, really neat to see and experience I got to go in and talk to people in local villages and also came home with a couple of their famous blankets. These blankets are worn by people all over the country. um, And they were actually originally a a gift from someone from England to the king of Lesotho. Uh, And so the king actually wanted all people to have a blanket. and, And so they actually opened a factory in South Africa and South Africa sends the blankets into Lesotho. Um, And Basutu people wear them um, while they're shepherding and um, doing their various jobs. It's very, very cold there. So um, this is a time where they actually went back in the 1800s from um, wearing animal skins to wearing these blankets. So there's so many cool things I could share about about, uh, Lesotho, but why don't we go ahead and get over to the podcast? Oh, that sounds super cool. I'm still trying to wrap my head around the high-low point as I keep thinking about that and making my brain hurt a little bit. Why don't you introduce our um, our podcast <laughs> guest, Jerry Lawing? Sounds good. This month's guest is Jerry Lawing, Economic Development Coordinator at Guadalupe Valley Economic Development down in Texas. Uh, Jerry has been a longtime GSA client, and along with getting to know her personal background, she'll also give us an economic development perspective from the unique cooperative angle. Well, Jerry, we are so excited to have you here with us today. You have been a client of Golden Shovels for a long time, and we're actually our first client in the state of Texas, which is really exciting. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you found Golden Shovel, how the relationship all began. So GBC has an economic development department. Um, We also actually have an economic development department entity called GBDC, which is a a subsidiary of GBC that actually is committed to economic development. And I was at an NREDA conference, the National Rural Economic Developers Association. I don't remember where I was. It was many years ago. Golden Shovel was exhibiting. And I think it was probably John Marshall that was there. And so we worked through some things and decided we would like to have a website devoted to economic development. And we did, I'm going to say three or four call interviews with different companies. Initially, we looked at some of the design and we're like, oh, we don't know. And because 
we love color. And so we wanted something bright and fun. And, but what sealed the deal for us with Golden Shovel was we had a call with John and he was so enthusiastic and had an answer for everything that we wanted to do and really just wowed us on the phone call and you know just said we can accommodate this we can make this happen we can move this around we can change your colors we'll see what works for you and it was just a slam dunk for us there was just really no other web design company that we talked to that had those kinds of answers and I know it sounds commercially and gimmicky, and you didn't pay me to say this. However, that has <laughs> continued throughout. And so, you know, we will email Darren and say, this doesn't look right. We need something different here. And literally it's done by the end of the day. And that has been invaluable. And so when other communities call and say, hey, Jerry, we know you guys use Golden Shovel. Tell us about it. It's just, it's such an easy recommendation because literally you guys are the most responsive company we've ever worked with. Wow. And, and just so everyone knows, we did not pay Jerry to say that and we didn't <laughs> even know she was going to. So Jerry, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that high praise. Um, Aww, well, we well, all well enjoy heard. working with you. So maybe we could dive a little more into that as far as you know, how Golden Shovel has actually met your needs. I mean, and how has having an economic development presence online benefited you? We were looking for a site that would not only promote GVEC and what we do, but also more specifically even promote the communities within our region. And so you guys have been able to tailor the site where we have all of our communities, all of the counties, all of the, so all of the individual cities, then all of the counties, and each one with contact information, each one with a little bit about that area and or that city or that county, kind of what some of their key industries are, things that they are doing. And then also you've, you've updated the uh, demographics and the data each year for us, which has proven to be very effective not only for us to, to be able to see that visual of it, but then also the, the raw data, but that's also proven really beneficial to some of the communities in our region, particularly um, smaller communities that don't necessarily have you know, access and a subscription to that ongoing type of analytics and data on their community. It gives a really good basic overview. And so we've seen that time and time again, that communities, communities have been able to use that information. And then just jumping over to what specifically Golden Shovel has done. I, I touched on this a while ago, but you guys have really tailored the site to what we need. So I know you guys have different modules and we've been able to kind of adjust those. We didn't want a big, broad property search and site search on with map and, you know, search pieces and all of that on the site that just seemed too overwhelming. So you guys were able to take another module and make that work for us. And then, you know, just the continuous effort each month, you know, I, you guys always show up to the table. I'm always running behind and trying to scramble to figure out what we need to be doing at that monthly meeting. But that's something that really keeps us on track. And I don't know if other web companies do that, but that's that's huge to be able to meet with, with the company once a month and go through all kinds of different things. I know last month we've had a blog on our website. That's something we haven't been able to keep up with, but we really want to try. So we're gonna we're gonna try to re re-put that up. But you know, Darren was able to take that down and say, okay, let's, let's shift and, and maybe add that back next time. So that flexibility is huge. And Jerry, uh, so you've not only had success with your website, but um, I was actually reading a uh, client spotlight that we did with you last year, I believe it was. And it said that you have had a lot of success on social media, on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. And I actually want to ask you this for clients that I've worked with, because I get asked time and time again, 
uh, you know, how do I make LinkedIn, especially LinkedIn and Twitter work for me with connecting um, to key players in economic development. So you had shared with us last year that that you've sought out and connected with real estate developers, companies, and CEOs on social media and had really great results. So can you share your secrets with us? What, what has made um, you so successful on those platforms? Oh, Bethany, you're in for it. And I'll tell you what, people that know me are like, oh man, I can't believe she asked her that question. <laughs> Because I can rattle on and on and on about it. And as you know, from our conversation a few minutes ago regarding some technical things on my computer, I am not a techie, but I do know that as you guys do, people want to, they want to connect ultimately, but they want to feel, they want to know why you want to connect. They want to understand it. And they they ultimately want to feel special. And so I am a, I'm not going to say a Twitter junkie, but I'm kind of a Twitter junkie. Twitter is so fast paced that you can keep up with everything that's happening, happening on the latest and greatest. You can also, it gives you the ability to tag someone. It gives you the ability to message someone. And really that's across the board on, on LinkedIn as well. I had someone tell me long, long ago before I ever thought about being in economic development, I was very, very young and said that you could connect with anyone. So I, I never forgot that though. And if you get on LinkedIn, you can many times go to the company website or a LinkedIn page. You can search their employees. You can find that CEO or that business development manager or someone who you know is in your lane and message them, tell them what you do, tell them why you want to connect, tell them you saw them, you know, their name in this article recently in the business journal, and, you know, you want to find out more. And I think probably I have been turned down, but I just blotted it from my mind. So I'm going to say probably never has anyone declined to connect. And then a lot of people I think have this perception, I think that's changing, but a lot of people have this perception that, you know, oh, it's just social media and she just likes social media. And I honestly don't, I'm not on anything really on a personal level other than for business, but I think there's huge power in that. And there is this wonderful opportunity to connect with the people you want to connect with right there at your fingertips. And, you know, if you want to promote something specifically, once you connect with them, you already have that platform. Then you have that jumping off space where then you can push content out almost, I'm not going to say directly to them, but, but there's that connection that's been made. And so, yes, I am a, I am a huge fan of the opportunity that's there specifically through LinkedIn and through Twitter. Well, Jerry, I think that it's awesome that you're using social media that way and have had a lot of success. It can be really intimidating for people. And and I think part of what you said is really important. And that's just to try, right? To try to make those connections and not be worried if they're going to connect with you or not. Because most of the time people, it sounds like, have been quite welcoming. Absolutely. And, you know, I opened a LinkedIn account, I think like a lot of people, and never did anything with it. And then when I went back, several years ago, maybe, maybe a little bit longer, but I thought, okay, I need to be on LinkedIn and I need to be looking and doing. And so I had hundreds of messages, you know, that I'd never looked at hundreds of, of invites, that kind of thing. And realized that my profile was not very good. I didn't have anything on there. And that I think can be intimidating to people because you think, is my education what it should be? Is my experience on there? Do I have people recommending me? All that kind of stuff. And to be honest, I don't know anything about all of the bells and whistles as far as recommendations and uh, endorsements and all of that. It's easy to get on a YouTube video and find that out. But I think what you said just then about you just get on and try. And if you're in the economic development business and many others, if you're not on that space, you're really missing this huge, big, bold opportunity. And I often say this to people, but they get tired of hearing it. But I remember a while back, John Longshore, 
who was with um, Global Location Strategies. And he said, anyone who is not on some type of, you know, Twitter or LinkedIn, and, and I'm paraphrasing and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but something to the extent that he really didn't, wasn't going to do business with those people because they just were not looking ahead to what was happening, you know, just sitting in your own little space and not embracing anything new. He felt like that was a representation of possibly other things. I think that's interesting. So basically you're saying that from what you were hearing, if you weren't on social media, it was a sign to the community at large that you were maybe stuck in the past and not willing to look forward. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for sharing this because I think overall the tips and the um, encouragement and knowing that it's, you know, it is working, it does work and our clients that we work with will definitely find that encouraging. So Jerry, I wanted to go back a little bit and just make sure that our audience knows a little more about you and the role that you play at GVEC, the work you do in economic development. But I'd like to go a little bit further back to when you actually started in economic development, because you were originally with the community of Gonzales. Isn't that correct? So I was in a chamber of commerce world and I lived in East Texas and actually The Economic Development Corporation there recruited me to come over, and I think I've said this in my story before, but I was a single mom and wasn't sure that that, you know, money was going to work out for me that way, not really weighing the, the value of the benefits that come when you go to work for a city government. So from there, I did move to Gonzales. And I worked for the Gonzales Economic Development Corporation as the director, um, probably, I think, for like a year and a half or two. And then GBC, who is headquartered in Gonzales, I came over to take the position of the economic development director there. So it's interesting because obviously the chamber, you work so closely with local businesses, then you're in a local community, and now you're in a position where the work you're doing is really regional. You know, GBEC has quite a large territory. So what's the difference from your perspective working for, you know, larger organization on the regional scale versus being in a singular community? I love, love, love working in a region. There's just so much fun to see. Part of our territory is more urban And then our territory to the south, going down towards the coast in Texas, is much more rural. And so you get the best of all of those things. You get the excitement of being along the I-35 and the I-10 corridor, Austin, San Antonio area. And then I am a huge fan of rural communities and rural America and rural Texas. And So those smaller communities have just, wow, just great stuff going on. And I get to work with them as well. Working for a city though, definitely has some good things going for it because you know specifically your mission a little bit better for lack of a better word. So, you know, you, you work for a board with a, with an economic development corporation in Texas, that's the way economic development is done. It's done at the local level. And you are clear who your board is. You are clear that this is the community. You are clear that these are the assets. This is the data that you need. And you know who the businesses are that you are working with that are existing in that community. So that's a really good thing. But overall, I'm going to say for me, working with GBEC has been a huge blessing, but also a huge big experience. So Jerry, you know, we do work with a lot of electric co-ops. I actually didn't uh, learn about electric co-ops working in economic development until I joined the Golden Shovel team. And uh, I was an economic developer in Northern California before that. So I know that there's economic developers and maybe some of our clients out there that aren't exactly sure what, uh, you know, part they take in economic development. So can you expand a little bit uh, on that Yes. I don't know that all cooperatives are intimately involved in economic development. In fact, I know they are not. And some have a business development department. I think there are few in Texas that have a as active of an economic development department as GVEC does. And I'm hesitant to say that because I, 
obviously do not know every single one. But even in a state as big as Texas, we kind of all keep in touch. So GVC has a very long history of doing business recruitment, being very, very involved in our communities that we work in. We, we say, you know, we work, we live in these communities. It's, it's who we are. So from the very beginning, and that's, that's really the cooperative model. And most cooperatives are very, very involved in the communities that they serve. But from the very beginning, GVC set out, um, and obviously this was in the 30s. I was not around then, but GVC has written numerous history books. The latest came out three or four years ago. And really the model has been to say, what do our customers need? What do our members need? So co-ops are, I say customers, but they're also each individual that GVC serves as a member of that cooperative. And, and you have a voice, which is very different than a large utility. So from the very beginning, GVC set out to say, okay, what do our members need? And GVC has had a home services office in the past, which was like appliances, the refrigerators, washers and dryers, and repair service for those. That's not something that we currently do, but that came about because out in the country, out in the rural areas of GVEC, that uh, service was not available. So they stepped up and said, okay, how can we do that? The water supply corporation, some of those were started with the help of GVEC. Also internet, which we still have a thriving fiber to home and internet service business. That was started because out in the rural areas, they did not have internet service. And so I know you guys are very familiar, I'm sure with you know, the huge broadband issue happening right now, but really just like, and I, I know I always sound like a commercial, but just like the rural cooperatives brought electric to the rural areas, they're doing that same thing with fiber and they're really, really well positioned to do that. So GBC has been involved in business recruitment for a long time, even so far as to actually traveling and before a formal economic development office was put in place, but actually traveling to recruit business to the region. And we play a role in incentives in recruiting business to the region. So the latest, um, we worked with Caterpillar in Seguin, I think it was in 2000. 2008 or 2009, but the latest project that we did was with AW Texas, which is a Japanese transmission manufacturing, high-tech manufacturing company. The GVEC actually purchased that land that that company is located on and held on to it for, I think, five or six years, and then provided all of the infrastructure to that site to make that a viable project. You know, of course, at the end of the day, we want to sell electricity. That's that's part of what we do. So bringing that load in is, you know, obviously a goal. But in addition to that, it's developing the communities and regions that we work in. And so just taking that company, for example, that was in an area along I-10 between Seguin, Texas and San Antonio, Texas. Um, I-10 is a main east-west corridor there, but there was a piece of that that did not have any kind of infrastructure other than just a very small residential level. And so bringing a company to that site was paramount to bringing the required infrastructure. And so that was a partnership with GBC, the city of Cibolo, Guadalupe County, the state of Texas, Centerpoint, the water provider, just numerous, numerous people. TxDOT came to the table on that. And that literally will change the face of, and already has, but change the face and the, the economic prosperity that's available along that main corridor. So that's why GVC has an involvement in economic development. And that's why we're so passionate about it. I think it's interesting when you look at the history of the organization and how your role really has evolved over time to meet the needs. And, you know, one of the things that we see across the country is the urgency to develop product, to make sure that there are 
shovel ready sites, industrial parks, even spec buildings so that site selectors have uh, really opportunities to show clients where they can locate and be operational quickly. Now, GVEC actually has been involved in some industrial park development in your territories recently. Isn't that correct? Yes. So we actually developed, again, with, with the community, there were actually another cooperative that GVEC merged with in Cuero and developed the DeWitt Industrial Park, which still has sites today. We continue to promote that property at that site. There is currently, I think, probably eight or 10 businesses in that industrial park. We are always looking for new opportunities. So if a community comes to us and you know has a need, then we're going to look at, at, as far as land purchase, we're going to look at that opportunity and see if we can assist and help. Right now, Tesla is, GBC is located very near to State Highway 130, which if, I'm, I'm going to jump gears here, I mentioned Tesla, but Tesla is actually located along SH 130. And for some of you outside of Texas, you may not realize, but that is the, you can travel faster on SH 130 than any road in the country. You can actually go 85 miles an hour. Wow. And we are located very near that area. In fact, part of our territory is on a SH 130 as it hits Interstate 10 coming in towards Seguin. So, you know, we're always looking ahead to what areas may become viable. And that is definitely an area that people are keeping a close watch on. There's a lot of development coming that direction. So actually, You've got Seguin in the middle and then heading towards Cibolo is where the AW Texas plant was and where GVC invested in the property there. And then you have to the east going towards Houston. You know, there's some opportunity that way as, as well. So it really comes down to being forward looking in part for the cooperative to try to figure out what opportunities are going to be on the horizon and try to get involved in that infrastructure planning early on. I couldn't have said it better myself. That's exactly right. That's exactly what we try to do from a development perspective. So you uh, graduated from the OU Economic Development Institute. Uh, What would you say is the most important lesson you learned through your education there? And should all economic developers be certified? It seems like long, long ago that I went to the Institute, but I will tell you there was somebody who made a huge impression on me there. That was Rocky Wade. And I'm sure many of your listeners and you guys may know who Rocky Wade is. Um, He has since passed away, but he reminded me of Mr. French on Family Affair. But (laughs) at any rate, you guys probably have no idea who that is. I have no idea. (laughs) You're going to have to look him up. He taught finance. I will tell you, I don't have a finance mind. That's an area I really, really struggle in. Our accounting department can verify that. But he brought that to life in a way that no one ever had for me. And so I followed him and he would send out emails after that, you know, just this and that, just an amazing man who really changed the way that I looked at finance and the way that I processed it. And so he was my big takeaway from EDI, but I also think that's used to, you had to go, I think it was a week every year. I think now they've really condensed it down. I don't know specifically, but I think you can do it two or three times a year, maybe, maybe quicker than that. I'm not sure. But, you know, I think maybe because um, you're going to have me bear it all here. So this goes back to the LinkedIn deal of, you know, oh, am I good enough for this? But I don't have a degree. So for me, that was a must. And the community that I was with really supported that and pushed that. And then your certification question of, do I think everyone should be certified? I don't know about that. I am a huge proponent of education. My husband actually went back to school many, many years after he you know, was out in the work world. And so I'm very proud of that. I'm a huge believer in that. 
And I often think I need to be one of those people that is, you know, walks across the, the university stage at 75 and says, hey, this is what I did. But then I get lazy and think, oh, you know, I don't know. But for certification, I think more than anything, I know some fantastic people that I highly, highly, highly respect that I think are phenomenal in the economic development world who are not certified and don't really feel like they need to do that. But I think for me, just from my perspective, I'm not sure I will do that. I keep thinking I'm going to, but it's a goal that you set for yourself that you're able to say, I accomplished that. And so I think more than anything in life, that's what all those things mean is, you know, I set myself on this path and I was able to accomplish that. And we hear this all the time. You don't know what you don't know. And the more, you know, the more, you know, all those cliche things, but it's so true. And there's just a big wide world out there of information, whether it be through certification, whether it be through EDI, whether it be through, you know, having your PhD, there's so many things you don't know until you actually learn them. So I guess I'm going to sort of from all of that, I'm going to say, yes, I think those things are really important. And whether I did them or not, doesn't mean they're not important. <laughs> so Jerry, I think you mentioned something earlier when you were talking about social media, and that was not being afraid to put yourself out there and try. And I understand that there's probably a lot of people who may find this field to be interesting, but because they don't have the educational background, or qualifications, they might feel like they're, they're not fit for that role. And, and I think by what you said, you've just proven that the most important thing is to actually care to try and that there are learning opportunities that are not necessarily traditional ones that will give you the tools you need to be successful. And quite frankly, that's something in the economic development field we tout constantly. You know, so many communities have fantastic uh, career training, technical opportunities that are very specific to a particular field that are not a traditional four-year degree and they help people get fantastic careers. So I think it's really important actually that you share that and I appreciate you opening up about it. Although I, I think education is extremely, extremely important. I also know at the end of the day that economic development is, it's about people and it's about connecting with people. I may not be a good finance person. I may not be this or that, or any of those other things, but I love people. I truly do love the stories and of, of what p other people are doing. And so many people inspire you every day. I started a little thing on LinkedIn called people I'll remember. And there's so many people that I'm, I'm thinking I'll just flood it and it won't even be meaningful. But if you can connect with people and you love what they're doing you can always find the answers. So I'm going to say another, another lady told me many, many years ago who actually worked for the State Department in Washington, D.C., and she told me, she said, you don't have to know everything, but you have to know where to find out. I may not know what you're asking me, but I can absolutely find out. That goes back to GVC. I think one of the reasons that and we've been told this, that one of the reasons that we are successful in the economic development uh, arena is one, we're very, very responsive. We respond immediately and we res respond with what's needed. But also if we don't know something, we're willing to find out and we find it out very, very quickly and we connect people and that's huge. Well, resources are really important. And I had wanted to ask you about your role with Team Texas, because I think that these, you know, regional and national economic development organizations can also be that type of resource to find the information you need. Can you tell us more about your involvement? Yes. So I had the great honor and privilege of being um, chairman of Team Texas this year. Team Texas was started, I think, in 1983 or 84. And it's actually a membership organization of utilities such as GBC, and then also mainly communities. So communities join Team Texas. It's a membership organization whose goal is to market the state of Texas. And it's a lead generation organization. Even in 2020, we ended up doing some virtual, we call them road shows. 
and on a on a good year without COVID, we will travel and you know there will be a team of four or five that will travel to visit face to face with companies as a team promoting the state of Texas, but also individually, you know, having that experience and having that lead. And in, in 2020, we did that virtually which proved to be pretty effective, I think. Um, and I think people were very receptive to that. That's when everybody got to be on Zoom. And so it became kind of a natural thing. But I am a big believer in working as a team, working as a region and working as a state. And particularly when you're Texas, when you say I'm from Texas, that opens many, many doors. I don't want to knock Minnesota in any way. But I don't know that when you say I'm from Minnesota, that has the same ring to it. So we just, we work as a team. It's, it's easy to promote Texas. And there is a connotation of being big and bold. And here's what Texas has to offer. And because we do economic development at the local level, each of those communities that is a member then has the opportunity to follow up with that and to kind of narrow it down from the state, but then narrow it down to their area and then to their communities. It's a wonderful organization and I, I anticipate it will continue to thrive for many years to come. So I'm curious who makes up the group that that travels around. Um, this is reminding me of something we used to do in the community I worked in, which was business walks. And so we'd take you know, myself from economic development, we'd take the, the city planner, the city manager, someone from parks, the parks department, and we kind of go around and, and there'd be someone represented from different parts of the city or community um, that might be able to help or answer questions and things. So is it similar or what, what, uh, who makes up that group and, and what are you doing when you go around and visit? So first and foremost, we're promoting the state of Texas and the opportunities in the state of Texas. So a roadshow can be made up of, say if the membership is 100 communities, then four or five of those communities, and it, it will vary every time. So it may not be the same group each time, but different out of that 100, four or five will, will travel to, an, to another state, to another region, and you know, make those company visits, make those acquaintances with site selectors that they may not know. And then those leads then get funneled out and whoever participated in that then is able to follow up. So similar to what you're talking about, but more on a business attraction. So Jerry, how long have you been involved in economic development organizations? I have been in the economic development space since... I think 2003. And then, you know, I just started out small and began working with a couple of regional organizations. And then of course, when I came to GBC, became much more involved in the region uh, and some of the state organizations, um, the governor's office of economic development here in Texas has a fantastic presence. So we work with them and stay in touch and follow what, what they're doing and, and ask for assistance if needed. And they are, they are just fantastic. But also work for some smaller regional groups. In Texas, for me, the Texas Downtown Association, when you talked about sharing information, we talked about that earlier, but they have a listserv. You know, many, many organizations have a listserv, but they are really grassroots, provide wonderful interaction between their members. So if, if you're a young person and you're, you're looking to find out how to contract for pavers in your downtown, something as simple as that, they're a huge resource for that. Um, I'm also a member of a couple of, I am not on Facebook. I actually did make a Facebook account only to connect with these couple of groups. And I don't get on there frequently, but there again, if you're young and you're starting out and you have questions, no question is ever stupid. It absolutely is not. And if you don't ask it, you will never know the answer. But there's a couple of Facebook groups within the state of Texas that, uh, you know, just put out a question and you will get 50 answers and 50 resources, company connections, 
that's invaluable. And then I know, you know, on LinkedIn, there's a lot of different groups that you can be a part of. And I think if I had to say, I think I've always been kind of mouthy and not afraid to say much, but (laughs) I probably should filter that sometimes, many times. But if you're, if I were to say to my younger self, I would just say, there's no stupid question. And you just have to have that thirst to find out. And if somebody thinks that you are silly and inexperienced along the way, so be it. It, That doesn't matter um, because you'll come out on the other end with that knowledge and that information. So Jerry, why should young economic developers get involved with state and regional, uh, regional organizations? The best example that I can give of that is the Texas Economic Development Council. But TEDC, they are the professional membership organization for the state of Texas. I think they have maybe almost a thousand members at this point. So you're drawing on a wealth of knowledge. Really one of the biggest, if not the biggest benefit to being a member of a statewide organization is as a young person, a young economic developer, man, you've got all that experience right at your fingertips. And I probably other states do this as well, but at TEDC, they have a resource library with documents from A to Z that you can pull upon. Then you've also got those contacts. I used to email people that I would meet at the conferences. And so TEDC does a conference three times a year. They used to do four, now they do three. And I would meet someone, you know, then I would read that they had something going that was similar to what I needed to find information on. And almost again, just like messaging on LinkedIn, but almost without fail, if you ask someone, you know, how did you, what does your agreement with your city look like for the EDC corporation? And, you know, if you, if you have an agreement with the city, what does that look like? And they'll send it to you. That's just one small example. When GBC was looking to develop the site along I-10 where AW Texas went, initially we were going to do an industrial park there. And I literally traveled across the state of Texas. It was great fun. I loved it. But um, I was able to go up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I literally started up in North Texas, far North Texas, went to Sulphur Springs, and literally worked my way back down, which I'm way south of Austin, and worked my way down, went through industrial parks, but also stopped and visited a couple of people I didn't even know very well. I just reached out and said, hey, can I tour your industrial park? They spent half a day showing me what they had done, how they did it, you know, the businesses that were there. And so if you're, if you're just on an island by yourself, you're not, you don't have those connections and you don't have any way to get them. So I'm a big proponent of being a part of professional organizations as well, because it gives you that one-on-one that you need with people who have been there and done that. I think that's a really good advice. There, there are a lot of retirements happening in the, in the profession right now. And so there is a new generation of economic developers that will need to step into those leadership roles. I think it's important to have uh, people like yourself who have had success and are in leadership currently to continue to encourage them to participate. So if you're a listener and you're not involved in any economic development groups beyond your own organization, get involved. It'll, it'll pay off. All right. So Jerry, we talked a lot about your journey to get here and about where GVC is at. We even encouraged new economic developers to get involved and to grow their careers. But what is next for you? What is next for Jerry? You know, I I love GBEC and um, I love the opportunity there. I love the vision there. I love the innovation there. And so we're going to continue. I'm going to continue with GBEC. But at some point, I am a terribly frustrated writer. And so I really would like to give a little bit more time to developing my skills as a writer. So we'll see. I don't want to write the great American novel, but I do love writing and I love writing stories and I love writing about people. So that, that would be something I'm going to look into doing. Well, that sounds amazing, Jerry. I actually, that's what I do in my off time while I'm not working. And while I'm traveling the world, I actually, I do travel blogging and I'm working on a book. So 
Okay. You know, if awesome. you need, if you need, and if you need a place, if you need to, you know, know some amazing places to go, right. I could share that with you. <laughs> so. Okay. Okay. Well, you definitely <laughs> peaked. You definitely piqued my interest. All right. So uh, we have come to the end of the podcast where we like to play our shovel toss game. So I'm going to uh, ask 10 questions, just answer them as fast as you can. And so we'll get started. So Jerry, what was the last book you read? Oh my gosh. Um, I don't know. Leadership and self-deception. Okay. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite podcast? Um, there's a one called Overland Bound. I love it. I can't get enough of it. Uh, what's the very first thing you do in the morning? I sit down and have a coffee with whipped up creamer on it. When you were little, what did you want to be when you grew up? Oh, I wanted to be Dan Rather. I wanted to be a journalist desperately. Awesome. awesome. Still do. Uh, who is your favorite superhero and why? My yeah. husband. He's a great oh, superhero. Oh, love that. <laughs> I really mean that. He's he's That's so awesome. awesome. I call him the, the coolest square peg I know. He's so cool. <laughs> Perfect answer. <laughs> what superpower would you want and why? I would like to be able to run really fast because I feel like I've become such a wimp that I, yeah, <laughs> I'd love to be able to like zoom around and run really fast. Superhuman speed. I love it. If you could live anywhere in the world for a year, where would you live? Uh, maybe India. India I've never been there, so I don't know that, but that's always held, held some allure to me. I also think I'd like to live in Alaska, but I wouldn't survive five minutes. <laughs> um, if you could have a meal with anyone in history, who would it be with and why? Thomas Jefferson. Just Ooh. because I find him fascinating. Um, when I was a little girl, I went to Monticello and just thought it was the most fascinating place I'd ever been. Never forgot it. Awesome. Uh, who is your favorite band or singer when you were a teenager? Is Tony DeFranco and the something... Y'all don't even know who that is. But as a teenager, I loved Barbara Streisand. That one I know. <laughs> uh, what was the most embarrassing hairstyle or article of clothing from your childhood? I'm going to give a really bad answer here. I don't remember ever having anything like that. I I hate to say it, but I, I do really like my hair. <laughs> and I've had the same hair since I was a little girl. That's awesome. I, I love that you that you have the same hair. <laughs> <laughs> and you still love it that's perfect <laughs> that's awesome all right well that's all 10 questions thank you so much for playing that was fun oh, that's <laughs> awesome, Amanda. yes and thank you so much for being on the podcast it was great chatting with you today and and thank you for sharing you know information about what you guys do and i think our clients and our listeners are really going to going to um take a lot from that conversation so thank you so so much for having me Thank you once again to Jerry Lawing from Guadalupe Valley Economic Development down in the great state of Texas. She has been a great Golden Shovel client and Golden Shovel advocate for many years. I've enjoyed working with her. Um, you can check out um, Guadalupe Valley Economic Development on the web at experienceguadalupevalley.com, where you can also check out their social media accounts, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Instagram. As far as Golden Shovel news, we recently launched an economic developer's complete guide to video marketing. You can go to goldenshovelagency.com and download that. Um, and this does conclude our inaugural season of Shovel Talk. We've really enjoyed this, getting into the podcast game, and we are all already fiercely working on a new guest for 2022. So everybody out there in the Golden Shovel world, the Golden Shovel universe, have a very happy holiday season, and we will talk in 2022.